Good morning, God bless. Thank you all. Wednesday night, James Delmar fell asleep, and uh, there'll be a memorial service for him Saturday night here at 7 o'clock. James is a, a patriarch of our church. He helped build this building. More important than that, he helped build the fellowship that exists before this building. And uh, he's been involved. He came here to New York, I, I gosh, over 30 years ago, I think, as a, as a missionary. He went to Amsterdam. Yep. You remember the year, Moses? I'll get that straight by, by Saturday. And, uh, and has stayed and has been an active part of our fellowship ever since. You can keep Kim and her family in your prayers, and um, we'll be here Saturday. Gracious Heavenly Father, we love you so much, and we are so thankful to you for your, your great kindness. We're thankful to you for clearly making known to us uh, your intentions throughout the ages, and that your kingdom is coming, and that your loved ones will be with you forever. I'm so thankful, Father, to have that comfort in our hearts now, um, knowing that James is uh, going to be with you in eternity and that he's going to enjoy that fellowship in the kingdom as it, when it comes. I thank you, Father, for helping all of us to continue to worship you and to live for you and to honor you with our lives today. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. The theme that we had for family camp this year was uh, workers together with God and uh, based on 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And a big part of being a worker together with God is understanding where God is at work. Turn, turn in your Bibles, please, this morning to the Gospel of John chapter 12. We're going to pretty much look at this chapter. And um, it's, it's having an awareness of where God is working in your life and in your community in the world um, family camp was, was a, a very good time, uh, as was communicated. For those of you that are, are new today, I know how treacherous it is to be looking at somebody else's family photos. And, uh, it's like, oh, did you see this one? Did you see this one? You know, so. but, uh, oh well. <laughs> For me, the, the great thing was to see, uh, once again, the importance of working together with God is the great manner in which we can enjoy a relationship with Him. We can enjoy fellowship with Him, which is really the most important thing of all, is to, is to have that fellowship with God, that relationship, that personal love relationship with God. And in order to, in order to work together with God, it's imperative to be able to see where God is at work in your own life. Uh, I, you know, we were, you saw pictures of the inn, and uh, there's one place in the inn I, I was walking through, and I had a cup of coffee, and, uh, or some, something I was drinking, and there were a, a couple of kids that maybe 10 years old, maybe 8 years old, they were in front of me. And they stopped right as I, and it was a narrow way, and they stopped right as I, it wasn't your kids. <laughs> and they, stood, they, weren't, they weren't from our camp. They, they, uh, they just stopped and they started talking. They were not aware of the fact that I was behind them. So I, I went to go around the one girl, and you know, again, she's, I'm behind her, so she doesn't see me. So as soon as I did that, she moved to where I was gonna go. And then, so now I'm, I'm, I'm again, I'm waiting, and then, all right, I'll go this way. And she moved to the other side. So I couldn't go that way either. And again, I'm holding a cup of coffee. And then, then as, as, as a, a little bit of time goes by, she starts moving backwards. You know, she's going to bang into me. She, this kid just wants to hit me. <laughs> and I thought, 
she really has, she had no awareness of what was going on around her. She really did. And it wasn't like I was being quiet. You know, I, I wasn't being uh, aggressive and boisterous, but, she, you know, you sort of have the sense when somebody's hovering over you, you know. And she didn't have that. She hadn't developed that yet in her life, and it will come as she gets older. And, you know, that a lot of times we're, we're not aware of what's going on. One of the, one of the uh, uh, I think it was the last teaching, well, the, the final, uh, the second to last teaching, John McCabe was teaching, and he had, he had one of the gentlemen stand up, Robert, who was a police officer. And uh, Robert is a retired police officer. He's, he's uh, been retired for a long time. He said, but he, he reflected back on his training. And he said, a big part of our training is as a police officer is to be aware of what is going on. If you're walking down the street and you see somebody that has a bulge in the side of their thing, you, there's the possibility that there's a weapon there. And, and that when you go sit in a restaurant, you don't sit in the, right by the door, you go in the back of the restaurant with your back to the, to the wall so that you can see what's going on. So you have this awareness of what's happening. And that's really the important thing with God is to have the awareness of where he is at work in your life, in your world. And, and, um, you know, that's the, and once you can see where he's at work, then you have the wonderful opportunity to join him in the work that he is doing. I think a lot of times our understanding of how it works with God is we're busy with our life and we ask him to join us in the life that we're living, which is obviously a little bit backwards. I mean, he's at work in the world, and he's been at work in the world since the beginning. He's got a mission. He's got a purpose. He's doing what he's doing. And, it, and we should be concerned about joining him rather than inviting him to join us. You know, God, I've decided to do this. Would you please help me? It really the, should be the opposite way around. It's where are you working, God? Well, in light of that, I've, uh, John chapter 12. Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus has raised from the dead. Six days before the Passover, this means, this is referring to the week in which Jesus Christ, the same week Jesus Christ is going to be taken and beaten. And as a matter of fact, in, in, I, I don't know the exact timing, but it's probably within four days or so, or three days or so, he's going to be taken into captivity. He is the Passover. So in six days, he is going to be killed. And this is that week of that, the last week of his life. And he's in Bethany with Lazarus, and the one that Jesus had raised from the dead. Now Lazarus has got a sister Mary and, and a sister Martha. Verse 2, so they, they made him supper there, and Martha was serving but Jesus was one of those reclining at, Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. How wonderful a memory this would have been for them for the rest of their life. Jesus was in their home and, you know, Martha had prepared the food. They were serving the food. They're sitting at the table and they're eating with Jesus. They're really doing the most important thing of all. They're enjoying the fellowship with their Lord. They're sitting at, his, at the table eating with him. And Mary took a, a pound of very costly perfume of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, who was intending to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor people. Now he said this not because he had concern about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as he had the money box, he used to pilfer what was put in it. That's such a mind-boggling thought, isn't it? The whole thing here, what you have is, you have two examples of the, the, of the antithesis of, of two things. You have true Christianity, and you have feigned religion or fake religion. Or I, I don't, whatever word you want to put, you have the right way and the way, you have the way of Cain, and you have the way of Abel. You have the way of Esau, and you have the way of Jacob. You have the right way and the wrong way. This, this woman, Mary, 
I don't know if she understood that this was the Passover. I don't know. I, I don't think she did. I don't think anybody really understood what was. Well, they didn't. They didn't understand what was before Jesus. They had no idea the suffering and the torment and the death that would be his soon. But you know, Mary really loved Jesus. She took something that was extremely expensive to her, and and took that 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 anointing, that nard, whatever that is, that anointing oil, and got on her hands and knees in this tremendously humbling reality, got on her knees and anointed the feet of Jesus. The very feet that six days later would have a spike driven through them. Were in her hands and she massaged them. How much that must have meant to her, the fellowship that she had with her Lord. That's the most important thing of all. She enjoyed that. And then she took her hair and wiped his feet with her hair. Is there any more humbling act? I mean, you know the Orientalism culture. I mean, if you don't, even if, you have no, if you're totally clueless of the cultural things that are being you know, broken here, you got the idea of getting down on your hands and knees and washing somebody else's feet with the most expensive thing you have and then wiping them with your hair. How loving! how tender, how compassionate, how ministering it was of her to the Lord. And to take, you know, her, her pride, her hair, and to dry her, her feet. I mean, this is, in her, we see really what God is wanted from the beginning. He's wanted His people well, to love Him back. And, you know, she shared this love for God through her Son, to His Son, to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. She shared that great, intimate, loving relationship. That's all God has ever wanted from you. He's not asking you to change the world or build a tower or, or do this whatever feat. All He really ever has wanted from anybody is love. You know, we were made for love. It's our purpose. It's the reason that God made humans was so that he had people to love. We were made to love. It's in the understanding that great love that God has for you and you manifesting it back to him is when everything fits together in your life. When it all comes together. I went to the hospital room and I looked in and I saw this woman who I love very dearly. Tears welled up in my eye. My stomach got really upset as I looked at her yesterday and I saw how withdrawn she was. And I went in and she saw me. When she saw me, she burst out into tears crying. And I got closer to her and I got on the bed and I sat next to her and I took her into my arms and I held her. I looked at her arms and they were filled with tracks again, black and blue, tracks from heroin. And she said, I just don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to stop. I keep on hurting everybody I love. I had to ignore the person who was sitting at the foot of the bed who was assigned there because it was a suicide watch. She had tried to overdose again. And I whispered into her ear, I love you, but more important, honey, God loves you. You're alive because God loves you. You will find yourself in accepting his love for you. You haven't yet accepted his love for you. It's not even about you loving him. It's about Him loving you. It's when you understand His love for you that everything comes together and then it's your love for Him. And then if you love Him, you love other people. It doesn't work in reverse. It's understanding His love for you. Mary understood that. This young woman I was with yesterday, if if she gets to the place of understanding this, and I, I believe God has, has drawn her, He has saved her life time and time again, 
And I believe he wants her. And if she will allow God to love her, if she can get to that place, she will get free. There's nothing else that she will do that will get her free. She's already been to the treatment centers. She's already spent months in rehabs and multiple detoxes. None of that has worked. When she understands God's love for her and accepts it in its totality into her heart and life, then she can have the freedom from this bondage that has tormented her. That's what I told her yesterday. And you know why I told her that with such conviction? Because it happened to me. And because the scriptures say so. Any of us that have known God for any length of time, it's because we've understood that he loves us and that his love is unconditional. We've been made to be loved. And many of us, in the situation that we have found ourselves in our life, we weren't loved the right way. Well, many of us, how about all of us? Because all of us, if we received any love at all, it was from an imperfect human who did it wrong a lot of the times. Some of us, uh, you know, were more destitute of love than others. Either way, we were made to be loved, and since we didn't get it from a human point of view, and if we didn't connect with God, we go through life not having that love. But that's what our purpose is. Our purpose is to be loved. If, you, if you're using something for the wrong purpose, it doesn't seem to work right. What works right is when you, when you are, you are allowed, you're allowing yourself through the understanding of the Scriptures and what our, what our Lord did for us to be loved. Mary got that. She really got that. She knew Jesus loved her. She knew it. Days earlier, Jesus raised her brother from the dead. Jesus is at her house. He's with her in her house. And I, I, I got to believe, I, I, I know this, because I'm going to read it to you in a minute. Mary's seeing where God is at work. She knows that this is what she is supposed to do. She's, a, she's taking the ointment that you would normally put on a body that is dead. And that the, the spices that you would use to anoint a dead body before you put it in the wrappings and into the grave, that is the exact anointment. That's what Jesus said. She has done this for my burial. She was sensitive to the working of God. She knew by God working in her, this is what she was supposed to do. Then verse, verse 7, Jesus, you know, Judas said what he said. Then Jesus said, let her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. And some of you probably have a footnote in your, your Bible. It brings you to the bottom of the page. The custom for preparing the body for burial. That's what she was doing when she anointed his feet. It was for him. And, and you know, later on they would understand this. We understand it as we're sitting here now. She, she was sensitive to God working in the world. She understood that Jesus was the work of God. And that she understood that this is what she was supposed to do. As opposed to this man who was ordained and called by God through Jesus, called by Jesus, anointed by Jesus to be one of the twelve apostles, Judas. He was chosen to be one of the twelve. He walked with Jesus. He heard, the son, he heard his teachings. He heard all about the kingdom of God. He watched Jesus heal the blind. He watched Jesus embrace the leper and heal the leper. He watched Jesus raise the dead. He was there when Jesus walked on water. He was there and saw it all. And yet, here he is working Jesus. What is going on here? This, should be, this money should be taken and given to the poor. He's reproving the Lord and the woman out of a motive of greed. What happened? How could this be? How could this be an apostle? How could this be someone that Jesus personally had the much trust for that he allowed him to be in charge of the finances? When the people were given their tithes and their offerings or their gifts to Jesus, he gave it to Judas to steward. What happened to Judas? He got pulled back into the world. He took his eyes off of the work of God. 
He started thinking about, maybe, maybe he started believing the words of Jesus that his life was coming, drawing to a close. I don't know. But I do know this. He was a thief. He was stealing from the Lord. The Lord was right there with him and he couldn't see the work of God. No longer. He saw it once. He saw it. But he didn't maintain it. I am so reminded of the Lord's prayer. Give us this, what? Day. Our daily bread. It really matters not if you're an apostle yesterday. What matters is, what are you doing today? We live in a world that, you know, that it says that Satan is the god of this world. It says that the prince of the power of the air worketh in the children of disobedience. The prince of the power of the air, it, the implication is, is that he's everywhere around us all the time looking to harass us. We saw the sermon on the, not the, the, uh, the parable of the seed and the sower a couple of times in, the, in this past number of months. And we see that when somebody hears the word of God, that the devil is right there to take it away from them. Even if you're an apostle, even if you're hanging out with Jesus, you still have to maintain your own heart. You've got to keep it real. You've got to understand what it's about. It's not about religious observances. It's not about looking the right way or doing the right thing per se. It's about your heart connected to the God that loves you and the Lord that loves you. You got to keep your heart right. And you can only keep your heart right one day at a time. And many times within a day, you need the help of God. Because it's, it, it's relentless. It doesn't end. I wish it did, but it doesn't. It will. How's that for a sentence? I wish it did. It doesn't, but it will. <laughs> when Christ comes back, the battle will end. But meantime, we're in a battle. You turn your back and you're going to get shot. My heart goes out to, to Judas that he would allow himself to get sidetracked. But that's, that's the parable of the seed and the sower. One of the things was that he, the allurement back into the riches of this world. He was about money. I mean, I, you know, before I knew the Lord, I, I knew what conning somebody was. You know, I knew how to deceive people, to work people to get money. But man, doing that to Jesus? Come on now. How blind do you have to be? Well, the work of God was right there in his presence. And what was going on, what this woman was doing was what, what God wanted done. It's exactly what God wanted done. For his son, before the days before him, before he would be taken and tortured. He, she was doing what God wanted done and he criticized it. It's a very humbling reality, isn't it? It's an it's a in-your-face kind of thing. You know what it, but let's get perspective to it. You know what it says? You need your daddy every day. You need to be with your father all the time. There's no vacations. You've got to pursue God every day. And it's, it's, a, it's an ongoing relationship. Some of you people, if you don't eat for one day, it's the end of the world. I mean, we're just going to die. Some of us don't eat one meal, we're going to die. Actually, if I don't finish at a proper time, you're going to get upset with me because we got lunch. <laughs> we understand the, the importance of having daily nourishment. Well, it's that way with this spiritual thing. It's keeping our heart right, keeping, living, and living to be loved by God and to love God back. And Jesus said, let her alone. Verse 9 a large crowd of Jews then le learned that he was there. And they came, not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. Verse 10, but the chief priests planned to put Lazarus to death also. It says chief priests in my Bible. I don't know what it says in the King James, but it's the high priests. It's really, it's not talking about, chief priests are the high priests. There's two high priests. There's only supposed to be one. There's Annas and Caiaphas. These are the very men who are responsible for the, the uh, torture of Jesus and the death of Jesus. Their, their plan, this is, this is how they viewed the work, was, was raising Lazarus from the dead the work of God? Yes. Yeah, obviously. You know, why did Jesus wait three days? Didn't we look at this recently? Why did Jesus wait three days? Because... God told him to because he, he wanted him to do that so that it would be 
undeniable that this man was dead and now is alive. It was also a type and an example for Jesus for what he would soon have to endure himself. They, they, that was the work of God, obviously. I mean, you guys got eyes to see. You can see raising Lazarus from the dead was the work of God, right? Well, the, fa the high priests didn't. The high priests, these are the guys in charge of all of Judaism. The high priest is the guy... The high, there's only, only supposed to be one, there's two. The high priest is the only one on earth who's allowed to go into the Holy of Holies once a year. He's the only human being on earth that is allowed to go into the Holy of Holies. You would think that this person would strive to live a holy life. He looked good. He had the robes down. He had the attire down. He had the phylacteries on his head and the phylacteries on his arm. He looked the part. He spoke the part. But in their hearts were darkness and evil. They're the ones responsible for what was pending that week. They would be the ones that tortured him and killed him. Their, their, their thing was, this guy Lazarus raised from the dead. We're going to go kill him again. God raised him from the dead. These guys decided that they're going to go kill him. Talk about missing the mark. Not seeing the work of God. You see, it's, it's not a matter of whether or not the work of God's at work in the world. The work of God is right in front of your face. It's not, it's not, that's not really the issue. Because the work of God is right in front of your face. The issue is... Are you sensitive to that reality? Can you see the work of God? These guys couldn't. They took the work of God as being a threat to them. Oh man, now everybody's following because he raised this guy from the dead. Well, we're going to kill that guy again. And then we're going to kill him. Hmm. Verse 11, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and were believing in Jesus. On the next day, the crowd who had come to the feast, this is the, the feast of Passover, when they had heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took the branches and the palm trees and went out to meet him and began to shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus, finding a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. Now, I, time isn't going to permit me to do this, but this is a record recorded in Zechariah, chapter 9, verse 9. Zechariah lived 500 years, about, five, about 500 years before Jesus. 500 years before that time, God gives the prophecy about this, this what we, exactly what we just read. And, that, and, and then, uh, I, I have no idea if Zechariah understood why he was writing what he was writing, but he wrote it. 500 years later, Jesus is doing this. God is at work in the world. He makes plans 500 years ahead of time. I screw up a week. I mean, you know, my calendar is, t I mean, I just, I, talking to Mike earlier, I thought I was supposed to meet with him on Tuesday, I was supposed to meet with him on Friday. I, I, I get it all mixed up all the time. Gee, God's got this plan 500 years. Now, I don't know that anybody there knew this thing. Well, they didn't. They didn't know that this was, it was after he was glorified that they understood what transpired here. God is at work in the world, and he's at work in the world now. He didn't go away. He's at work in our world right now. Is do we have the ability to see where he's working? And you know, in and of yourself, nah, you don't. But if you've got a heart for God and you're allowing him to love you and you're concerned about loving him and you're asking him to help you and to guide you and to give you that daily bread, you can see. 16, these things his disciples did not understanding at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him and that they had done these things to him. Nobody had any idea that what they were doing was a fulfilling of a prophecy that was written 500 years earlier. 
It wasn't until after he was glorified, which means after he died and he was resurrected and he ascended, then they understood, wow, do you remember that? How he did that? And, you know, they thought they, they, they had, but God was working in the people at that time to do what he had planned would be done 500 years early. He worked in them to do this. God is at work in the world. Verse 16, these things his disciples understood, verse 17, so the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify about him. For this reason also the people went and met him because they heard that he had performed this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are not doing any good. Look, the world has gone after him. The Pharisees, had, they had commissioned themselves to go out and to hinder Jesus from moving things. And, you know, you guys aren't doing a really good job. The whole world's following them now. You know, the Pharisees are another group of people. They're, they rose up before Christ came, after the, sort of like after Malachi, before Matthew. During that period of time is when the Pharisees rose up. These people, the reason that they rose up, they, what their specific purpose was, was to safeguard the Scripture. Their whole thing was to keep the Scripture safe so that it would continue to live on. They were very meticulous and concerned about the scribes translating it, and they wanted to protect the Scripture. And, you know, they were, they, their intentions that originally were very, very good. Now look where they're at. It doesn't matter what happened yesterday. It doesn't matter the commitment or anything else. It's where are you at today? What's going on in your life right now? And these guys were always at odds with Jesus. Verse 20, now there were some Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. These men came to Philip, who was from Bethesda of Galilee, and began to ask him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. And Philip came and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip came and told Jesus. And Jesus, as his manner is, his answer has got nothing to do with the question, or is much deeper than the question. Verse 23, and Jesus answering them, saying, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. As you read, you continue to read in John, you understand that that glorified means to be crucified, to be put to death, to be raised from the dead. Truly I say to you, I'm, I'm glad these guys want to see me, but there's a little bit more important things going on right now. Truly I, truly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. You know God made that available for Jesus to understand. Because what Jesus was surrounded with on a regular basis was unbelief. There, was, there were multitudes and multitudes that followed for the signs, but very few that really believed. Even Judas you know, turned against him. But Jesus understood that he was God's plan for man's redemption. He knew that when that seed was put in the ground, that seed died, and then it grows up and it produces so much more fruit. His dying was necessary so that there would be this fruit. Those of us here today, hopefully, are a part of that fruit. Verse 25, he who loves his life loses it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. Where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. 27. Now my soul has become trouble. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. I, I, he, he's become sorrowful. Other translations say heavy and sorrowful because he knows what's pending. He knows what is required of him. And he says, what am I supposed to say to God? You know, not, I'm not going to do this, but this is the whole purpose for which I came was to be the sacrifice for humanity so that we could have our redemption and our forgiveness. So his, what he did say was, Father, glorify your name through me, allowing me to do the work that you've called me to do. Let it bring glory to your name. Then a voice came out of heaven. I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. So the crowd of the people who shout, stood by and heard it were saying that it, 
had thundered. Others were saying, an angel has spoken to him. And Jesus answered and said, this voice has not come for my sake, but for your sakes. Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Talking about Satan. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which he was to die. The crowd then answered him, We have heard out of the law that Christ is to remain forever. How can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? Jesus, Jesus even, even when you go back and you read that thing in Zechariah about him coming riding in on the mule, well, right afterwards, he's riding in to become the king. Well, he didn't do that. And they're saying here, how can you say you're, you're, this, you're this, you know, the Messiah, and you talk about being raised, lifted up, being raised from the dead, you're not supposed to die, you're supposed to come in and rule forever. Who, are, who is the Son of Man? And Jesus said to them, for a little while longer, the light is among us. Or for a, little, for a little while longer, the light is among you. Walk while you have light, so that the darkness will not overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he goes. While you have light, believe in the light, so that you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke, and he went away and hid himself from them, as Frank was talking earlier. But though he had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing in him. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah, the prophet, which he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of Yahweh been revealed? That's a quotation from Isaiah 53. The very fact that the high priests were the way they were, and the Pharisees were the way that they were, and the people did not believe, that too was the work of God. Their unbelief, it was all prophesied that that's the way it was going to be. This wasn't something that was a surprise to God. This was the setting in which he wanted for his son, or else he wouldn't have been taken and crucified and the whole thing wouldn't have happened as it happened. It all was the work of God. Even though it seems to have been negative that these people didn't... I'm not saying that God made them to be unbelievers. He knew that they were going to be unbelievers. And He knew that the response to His Son was going to be very negligible. But He also knew that what He had to suffer, die, and then God raised Him from the dead so that the multitudes could choose one day to accept Jesus. Verse 39, For this reason they could not believe, for Isaiah said again... He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart so that they would not see with their eyes and perceive with their heart and be converted and I would heal them. It's, it's fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah, the way that they were during that time. Again, God at work. Isaiah is 700 years before this time. 700 years before God knew this particular detail about what would happen when his son was here. God is at work in the world. These things Isaiah said because he saw his glory and he spoke of him. Isaiah saw his glory and he spoke of him. That's from um, Isaiah 6. Nevertheless, many even of the rulers believed in him, and because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him, for they feared that they would put, be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the approval of men, rather than the approval of God. That's a terrible statement, isn't it? We don't want to have that connected to us. They were more concerned about what other people thought of them than they did God's approval. And Jesus cried out and, and said, He who believes in me does not believe in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me sees the one who sent me. I have come as a light into the world so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my sayings and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I, do not, I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. 48. He who rejects me 
does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. And that is the word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. For I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me, he has given me commandment as to what to say and what to speak. God is the initiator of the words that Jesus spoke, of the deeds that Jesus did. In John chapter 5, I'm not going to go through these places, but you can look five, John 5.30, John 8.28 and 42, John 11.56, John 14.10, over and over and over again, Jesus uses that word, initiate. I did not initiate the words that came out of my mouth and the deeds that I did among you. God was the initiator. God was the initiator working in the heart of Mary. God was the initiator behind Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. God was the initiator in the, the hearts of the people to throw the leaves down before Him and to say, Hosanna in the highest. God was the initiator of the mule and Him driving into, or the colt driving into Jerusalem. God was the initiator of everything that Jesus said and did. And how it came out, none of it was a surprise. God had foretold of this in the Old Testament so that we can come and look in the New Testament, see what Jesus did, go back to the Old Testament and say, wow, this is the Messiah. He is, this Jesus is indeed the Messiah. God initiated all of this. I know that His commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the things that I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. His words were eternal life. I guess in conclusion I'd say to you, open your eyes. God is at work in the world. He's at work in your world. And so much of our walk with Him is in seeing where He is at work and then joining Him. As we do that, as I see him working in the world and I join him in the work that he is doing by his grace, it strengthens my relationship with him. That is, my love relationship with him grows as I experience the work that he wants me to do with him. I mean, how close was Jesus with God? You know, so, Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to know you and to walk with you and for being together today. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.